Welcome to the Million Vegan Grandmothers podcast. And I am here with Angel and Light from Gentle World, Gentle World in Hawaii. One of the first established, as far as I know, vegan intentional communities. There's been vegan communities before this, but this one was formed, it sounds like, in in as an intentional community based on the principles and the vision of veganism. So thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you for having us. Yes, especially. As far, well, as, as far as I know, we were the only vegan community for years. I don't know how many there are now. I hope there are many. But when we started, we looked around there. There were no vegan. There was, there was no word. Nobody knew the word. And if anybody knew it, they would say vegan. It's hard to find vegan communities even now. People ask us if we know of other places and somehow it hasn't been easy to find other places that have actually been able to last and survive. Well, that's what Paul Watson said, Captain Paul Watson in an interview that I did with him yesterday. He said, you know, before the word vegan used to, people used to look at you as if you're from a planet called Vega or something. <laughs> so now it's different. So that on that note, tell me when... Gentle World World got started in Hawaii as a conscious, intentional vegan community. It didn't start in Hawaii. It actually started uh, quite a well, quite a long way from Hawaii. In Florida. Uh, in Florida, didn't it start in upstate New York? Well, not, not as a community. A community was mainly in Florida. I mean, it started with us in New York, my wife and I. But as a community, it started mainly in Florida because it was warm and easy to uh, easier to cheaper and easier to live in that warm climate. And back then we, we needed cheaper. It was 1970 when Light and Sun became vegan and they didn't know there was a word, but they one step at a time became vegan through their realizations. And then just friends who got together, who um, listened to what they were saying about it and agreed, which was very you know, few and far between that people felt the same way. And those people wanted to band together because they felt kind of isolated from the rest of humanity around them that did not understand that at all. And that's kind of how Gentle World was born. Well, <clears throat> briefly, I'll tell you how it, how it came about was when my, at the time my future wife and I got together, we said, well, what we want to do with our lives is follow the truth, find out what the truth is, and then and then live it. And shortly after that, we went to a, a movie, kind of a documentary movie. I think it was called Mondo Kane, which I'm not sure, was, which means dog's world. Anyway, it showed all the, the different insanities in the world, of which there are many. And one of them was four strapping men hitting a bull over the head. I think it might have been after a bullfight hitting him over the head with sledgehammers and the poor creature was screaming he's a huge bull screaming and they must have taken him 20 hits before he went he went down so we walked out of the theater and we said well there's the truth we didn't know about is that how they get meat i mean i never thought of it before i grew up with elsie the cow you know they used to show i don't know if you and that doubt if you're old enough to remember elsie the cow but they try to make it like a cartoon, you know, like everything was okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we came out of there and we decided not to eat meat. And then we looked further into it and what they do to animals. And we stopped, the, we became vegan. We stopped the other things. We stopped using wool. We stopped using leather. We buried our boots, my army boots and shoes and things. And we, uh, that'd be, we didn't know there was a name. We just knew that that's what we were doing. We were avoiding all things that cost animals their lives. So that's how it began. And then we kind of, we couldn't sit with people who, who ate meat. We, we, and we, it was difficult to even converse with them because they thought we were nuts. So eventually a few people, as Angel said, listened to us and became vegan themselves. And before we knew it, we were forming a group, which back then was called the Commune, which back then was, was easy to form. It, it, See, the, the, the powers that be, they don't want you to cooperate and get together, which is really a, a way to handle the world. The truth is we're all, the whole world's a community, a commune. So uh, we had to fight that battle. But at one time, there were 35 of us. Every Thanksgiving in Florida, when we lived in Florida, we would have 
all the vegans we knew back then, it was probably about 70 in the whole state. And we would have a big Thanksgiving, a real Thanksgiving dinner, in which giving thanks was the truth of it. And we would all have, uh, we became the food people because when, I, when we started, the food was, to say the least, bland. And we knew that it wasn't going to be easy to talk people into changing what they were eating into eating bland food. So we became the food people. My mother was a chef, not a vegan chef, a regular chef. And we learned different tricks from her. And we became the food people. At one time, we had the best chefs that we knew of in, in the whole vegan world. And we used to, uh, wherever we went to a vegan meeting, we would be the ones who brought the food. And that ended up uh, leading to the publication of their first cookbook back in 1981, which was, um, you know, back when vegan recipes were very hard to come by. Nobody really knew how to prepare food. And they published a full length, 100% um, vegan cookbook called The Cookbook for People Who Love Animals. Originally called The Cookbook for People Who Really Love Animals. Uh, the public didn't want us to say that. And we couldn't <laughs> use the word vegan. Nobody knew what it meant. We had to say pure vegetarian. Mm -hmm. This goes to show you how far things have come in that way. That's my biggest hope is how far things have come. Not that it's over by any means, but it certainly is going. It's an idea whose time has come. And there's nothing, I think Victor Hugo said that, nothing that will stop an idea whose time has come. And that's where it's at right now. And the hope is mainly in, in these, this new generation of kids who can see on the internet what they do to animals. I mean, I didn't know as a kid what they were doing to animals, but nowadays, you know, at the push of a button, they can, or maybe two buttons, I'm not sure. That information is so much more readily available. It is getting out there now, the, the truth of what's going on. So um, that truth is, is coming to light in a, in a whole other way. Yeah, back then, nobody knew, nobody even really knew the word vegan. So when they published that book in 1981, it was really groundbreaking. And that was what launched them into becoming an educational organization, a 501c3. So it started as an intentional community, grew into... Um, also being a, a, a nonprofit educational organization. And that's when they went from, they did the cookbook, but they also went into seminars and lectures and classes and workshops, cooking demonstrations. Um, and over the years that's evolved into showing film screenings and um, you know video and audio lectures, all sorts of different things that they've done over the years. They used to have a, uh, a mail order catalog where they they made vegan t-shirts back in the 1980s and uh, I mean it's amazing now to kind of go through the the archives and see how much history there is in gentle world I mean you know five decades of vegan history that's uh, certainly something to be proud of and in 1984 we sent out Christmas cards to everyone we knew saying that George Orwell didn't know about us <laughs> But Gentle World was bringing some hope against this. Uh, we sold, by the way, that yellow cookbook about, I'd say about 100,000 copies over the years. Yeah, we just actually sold out the, the final print run and uh, the last cases from the warehouse have been shipped out to different sanctuaries and uh, different organizations who are now taking them to festivals and using them as fundraisers and things like that. And that was actually really heartening to see because... Um, you know, we, we ended our relationship with the book distributor, but our supporters from around the world, kind of, I mean, from around the United States, pitched in to take the last few cases and help to get them out there to people. So it definitely is a, a much loved classic of the movement. And the people who remember it from the early days remember it as being a kind of beacon of light in a time when, you know, it was just so unusual to be a vegan that they didn't, you know, they didn't even have recipes, let alone all the products and, and restaurants. Let me add, we didn't, didn't just have recipes, we had quotes. So we didn't want to quote ourselves because that wouldn't have meant anything. So we quoted famous people, Einstein and uh, Tolstoy. Uh, Tolstoy and Balshevi Singer, Da Vinci, who had said something about not eating animals. So, yeah, we thought it was a good idea and I think it helped. Once again, we don't know what, what but I see the changes in the world. So it came from somewhere. And now the vegan movement has taken on such a life of its own. I mean, it's really snowballed and mushroomed and 
Um, now it's just become so huge. I mean, it's amazing when you think back to those days when they used to they used to fantasize about having uh, labels on products that would tell you that a product is vegan because they had to read every label to check. So it was a kind of a dream that one day there'll be a vegan stamp on products. And of course now- Or vegan dog way. food. Well, you used to dream that they would have vegan dog food. We made our own. All our dogs have been vegan. And there must be 30 of them over the years. They were all vegan and we- uh, Did homemade dog food at the time. Homemade dog food. And now we used to dream, like you say, about having those milk bone shaped things, you know, with, with, with bone. And now they have vegan milk bone type of uh, products and we feed them vegan. I want to give a plug. What's the name of that company? V-Dog. V-Dog. Yeah, V-Dog is, uh, you know, just they've done amazing work in providing. Yeah, we really have two good uh, rescue dogs here, a Greyhound mix and a Whippet mix. They're very fast. <laughs> I love V-Dog. <laughs> I interviewed Linda Middle where the founder of E-Dog uh, on one of the podcasts and it's lovely how that came about and yes I mean there's it must be amazing to see the changes after 50 years and especially in the last decade it's really increased and and there's so many grandmothers that are very big participants now in the vegan movement and have one of our participants Reverend Beth Love you know her foundation is Eat for the Earth and her food book is called Taste Like Love and and so it's been a huge evolution in, in consciousness in the last while. And it must be beautiful to witness that after so many years of there being, you know, very little change. As I say, it's the most hopeful thing I see in this world. Because the only thing that's going to change people's consciousness. They can't go on killing and expect not to be killing. They kill four-legged living creatures. As is going on now, they're killing two-legged people. It's and now they're talking about a nuclear war. It's uh, I must say it's a little bit of an insane asylum. I mean, to talk about a nuclear war that doesn't make a lot of uh, rational sense, but they're talking about it. Veganism represents such a major fundamental shift in consciousness. I him, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this whole idea of going from this idea that everything outside of ourselves exists to serve ourselves, which is kind of what the predatory mentality is it's if I want it I will take it even if it doesn't belong to me whereas veganism is more you know a, re a rejection of that and um an understanding that other beings lives and what comes from their bodies and their children exist to serve them not to serve me so when we make that shift internally it has such broad impact in the rest of our lives, you know, and our ability to uh, just demonstrate and, and practice respect towards compassion, compassion respect, empathy, um, and this understanding of our place in the world, which is just one of wanting to tread more lightly and not cause harm when there's no need for it. Um, you know, do as least harm as we possibly can. I think if everybody made that shift, obviously, we'd be living in a very different world, one which... Um, we wouldn't be so afraid in not just anim other animals, but human animals too wouldn't have to be so afraid. Yeah, it's about love and service, love and service. That's what we all came here for. And it's about remembering, you know, remembering our, our innate compassion. So what's going on in Gentle World right now? How many, how many residents live there? How many people come and visit and learn uh, about your community? How active is it at this point? Yeah, we have about um, we have about twelve members, but they're spread out in different places. So um, here at our Hawaii Center, there's uh, five of us here full time, um, and visitors coming and going. We had a really really active visitor program, and then with COVID, we put it on pause, and we're trying to reassess how to best open it up um, while you know still keeping everybody safe. And it just kind of caused a bit of a shift for us that we haven't quite, um, you know, picked it up again, but we are open to inquiries from people. We're just kind of taking each one on a case by case basis. Um, we have a second um, property about 15 minutes from here that we've been doing some additional growing on expanding our veganic agriculture. 
Um, but the future of that is a little bit uncertain. So we're trying to um, come to how we're best going to be able to keep that going. But at the moment, we're offering grazing space to rescued horses, which feels really good because there's a horse rescue here that finds it hard to find grazing space. So the land is providing that for her. These are horses who were rescued from what they call last chance auctions, which is um, basically they've come from various places that horses are used for different things and uh, they will be sent to the slaughterhouse if they don't get one last chance, hence the name last chance auction. So this horse rescue sends people to these auctions and rescues horses, brings them here. And right now um, they're grazing on what we call vegan land, which is really beautiful to be able to offer them that space. Which by the way, is a symbiotic relationship because it's very tall grass and very difficult to maintain. And they're our lawnmowers. <laughs> they do an incredible job. <laughs> it's really nice. And they're beautiful to see and they, they mainly eat all day. <laughs> And occasionally you get to catch them running as a herd, which is just such a beautiful sight. You know, they play and shake their heads in the wind. And it's just yeah, really, really beautiful to have them as a part of our reality there. Um, we still do, you know, we do um, quite a bit of online outreach. So we've over the years developed quite an extensive website with uh, lots and lots of information on there for um, aspiring vegans, new vegans and also seasoned vegans who can benefit from uh, maybe some additional inspiration or, um, you know, information that helps them to deepen their commitment or just be reminded of the vegan community um, that exists around them. And some people I know, even having been vegan for a long time, might feel sometimes a little bit isolated from other vegans, especially if they don't live in a big city where there's lots of access to vegan community. Um, so we try to provide um, lots of insightful personal stories of people, you know, how they how they became vegan, why they became vegan, why it's a lifelong commitment for them. We share a lot of that on our website. So um, people should definitely go and check that out. We have a, a free downloadable ebook called um, Vegan FAQ, Demystifying Veganism with 20 Simple Questions. And that's the result of many years of compiling just responses to some of the most common questions we hear frequently, trying to help people understand what it really is. Because often when people come to visit us, especially when, when we had, like I said, this very active visitor program, people would often come, you know, with this much understanding of what veganism is. And when they came here, we would try to just broaden, you know, broaden their perspective on it and help them to understand that it's more than just a diet it's more than just something you do for your ecological footprint. Um, it's not just about health. You know, health is a nice reward. It's a fitting benefit when you choose to do something right. But it's really about, you know, taking a stand against the violence and exploitation of our fellow sentient beings. So, you know, we often found that when people came to visit us, they would leave either they weren't vegan when they came and they would leave vegan or they might have been vegan when they came, but they would leave more committed to their veganism and maybe more committed to wanting to do activism and that sort of thing. So we really like being able to share with the public a perspective that maybe takes a little further um, than what people have been exposed to in other places. And I, well, I just want to add, it's not just the animals we eat, it's wild animals, the hippos and the rhinoceroses and that they're making extinct. I think they've already made one, one uh, rhinoceros pygmy extinct. And, it's all the animals that suffer. It's not just the ones we eat, but it's got to start there because that's the closest that people get to uh, animals other than their pets. And that's the cause of so much of the other, the habitat destruction and everything as well. And it's also, I think, really gets to the heart of our, um, you know, our numbness to animals, the fact that we can actually take them into our mouths and ingest them. That's kind of like... We need to stop doing that if we want to open our hearts and compassion to them, because that's really, I think, the most callous is to actually take their bodies and feed on them. <laughs> Will Tuttle does an amazing job of going into that in his book, you know, that relationship with the food that we eat and, you know, what that means when we can do that to other beings who, you know, before being killed, they were thinking, feeling um, beings who you would want to pet on the head you know, and uh, next thing you know, putting them on the grill and taking them into our mouths and swallowing them 
that's that's pretty um, disconnected, you know. So I think the food is a really important point. But we do also try to let people know that this extends further than that. It's also about the animals we experiment on. It's also about the animals we enslave in order to be entertained by them, you know, whether that's in circuses or aquariums or zoos or um, horse racing, dog racing, bullfighting, all of those things. Um, and it's also about even the pet industry. I mean, people don't realize that it's one thing when you rescue a homeless animal who needs a safe family to be with, but it's a whole other thing when you walk into a pet store and buy an animal off the shelf. I mean, that's a whole exploitation industry behind that as well that also leads to the deaths of millions and millions of dogs and cats. So, yeah, we just try to help people understand that there's it's a whole web, you know, the animal trade is a gigantic industry and they're all linked together. So if you reject meat because you don't like the violence and the killing associated with meat, don't forget that just over here is dairy. And, you know, with dairy, those cows are only kept alive for so long and then they go to the slaughterhouse along with their cousins raised for meat. So a lot of people don't recognize that where they might take a stand objecting to one element of it. There's a whole right. web of the animal industry that's very much interconnected. It's, a, it's an animal holocaust. It's, it's, it's a very fitting word, though some people object to uh, that comparison. It's a comparison to be made. It, even in the fact that, uh, you know, they trans... Sure it's working. <laughs> Sorry. To come back in. Uh, I mean, you want to get on? You want to get? She heard us talking about the dog, and she said, "I'm going to go see if there's any out there." You know what the dog means? Oh, those beautiful four-legged companions, right? Is that not unconditional love? Oh, they know about it. Oh, they, yeah, yeah. I they think they're the people. angels on earth. If they're, if they're, if God tells me there are angels on earth, who were they? I'm going to say dogs. <laughs> Plus, they're the most unconditionally loving creatures I know. Oh, well, when my, father, when my father was passing, he had a massive stroke and it was the left side of his brain that was stroked. And I had read a book a few years before that by a neurosurgeon called My Stroke of Insight. And she was very linear and the side of her brain, the left side was stroked. So she was able to feel everything really deeply. She could feel the nurses that were stealing her energy and thinking very negative about her and the ones that were really just infusing her with love. And that's the side of my father's brain that was stroked just about three months. He was only here for a couple of months after his stroke. And he had a childhood dog from the time he was four till he was 18. His father was quite abusive. And he spoke, he spoke to this dog um, in Finn, this, this dog that he had from the time he was four till 18 sat by his bedside as he was crossing the veil. And he talked to him in Finn, his dog was waiting for him to take him over. Of course, my siblings thought he was hallucinating, but I knew that was not true, that he was able to actually because the veil was thin, the part of his rational brain was shut down. So he was able to just feel his dog beside the bed waiting to, to take him across. So oh, I have no doubt that's true. That changed me. That changed me that his dog that saved his life many times from the time he was four till he was 18 growing up in the middle of the bush in Northern Ontario was waiting for him. Mm. Wow. That's lovely. That's really nice. Comforting. Yeah. Yes. Something I would love to meet uh, all the dogs we've had. <laughs> Saddest thing about them is they don't they don't live long enough. It's the only negative thing I can think about them is that they don't live. But a little boy once said to his father after he lost his dog that maybe they go so young so that we can love more of them. Oh. You know, if you only lived to ninety, you'd have one dog all your life. But and I I know I look at that as perhaps a good answer, even though it came from an eight year old. These two well, maybe more a, so than it came from an eight-year. These two came from a local rescue, and um, they were both hard to adopt, you know, dogs who it was hard to find homes for. And um, she talked us into fostering them, <laughs> which we, we tried to help them find homes, but it didn't go so well. So they um, ended up making a home right here. We love them. They're, they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm, I'm always curious about how a vegan diet will allow a dog to release trauma. Just as a human, you know, one of my teachers said he's 
he's a psychologist, a psychiatrist, but also an MD, uh, Dr. Gabriel Cousins. I studied with Gabriel Cousins, um, completed a master's level with him uh, in the Essene ministry in um, live food, spiritual nutrition. And he always made the connection when people would say to him, he was quite matter of fact, you know, you can't say that there's certain, you know, minerals and vitamins and certain nutrients and eggs, you know, that maybe we should have. And he said, I'm, I'm not going to argue about to you about the nutrients and eggs. I'm on a spiritual diet. I'm on a mm-hmm. diet that's going to elevate my consciousness. And he said, you know, maybe before when somebody came in anxious before he became, you know, vegan, which he has been for many, many years, what used to, you know, talk to them about what was going on for them. But he says, now it's like, what did you have for lunch? So if we want to look at the reciprocal impact of what we put on our in our body, and we see depression and anxiety at an all time elevated rate. And, and, you know, that's what we're putting into our body, when we're eating the flesh and secretions and the suffering of, of other beings. And I think once people really get that, that's a life changer when they realize their sensitivity and their ability to cope in an insane world. Like it's like we're walking around an insane asylum and, and we need to just hold space for love. It's, it's challenging. It's challenging for us that we're born, even maybe we were born with a vegan heart, but we're, we're not told that was the way to help us soothe. And then once we figured it out, then, you know, there's, of course, there's no going back, but I'm, I'm very curious on how, how a dog can settle down a lot more after some trauma on a vegan diet. We call it being adulterated, by the way, growing up from childhood, the innocence of childhood of being adulterated. Yeah, sad. Sometimes I think it would be a better world if the kids ran it. Or the dogs. We had a dog who um, had run away from an abusive situation and he was found on the street just starving and almost dead by one of our caretakers. And when we came back from our New Zealand center, he was here because he couldn't be adopted out either. And we kind of pieced together. We never knew the exact story of where he came from, but we pieced it together from his um, behavior in certain situations. And we figured he came from a pig hunting situation, which is very common here in Hawaii. They starve dogs to get them to go harder after pigs. And um, he was gentle as a lamb. Wild pigs? Wild wild pigs? Yeah, feral pigs. Um, Wild? So wild, yeah. So he um, had, he he would walk up to our rescued bunny rabbit and just give him a sniff and a lick. And he was completely gentle. He was like a vegan by nature, but they had trained him into this pig hunting thing. So um, he, of course, on with us, he was eating a vegan diet, which he was happy with from the beginning. And he had to heal from a lot of trauma. I mean, he would, um, whenever he was eating, he would look up every 10 seconds to make sure he wasn't being attacked by other dogs, because that's how it is in, the, um, in these pig hunting dog packs, is that when you're gentle like he is, you're kind of the bottom of the heap, and you could see that he was always having to keep an eye open. And I used to think about him, you know, that he had pulled himself from a pig hunting situation to a vegan intentional community, to being the dog at a vegan educational center. And it was so fitting to his nature that was so gentle and just wouldn't hurt our rabbit, you know, and now here he was eating vegan food and becoming a vegan ambassador, being a vegan dog. And sometimes thought there was this part of him that actually took himself from that situation escaped which is pretty incredible in the first place and 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 risked his death because when they found him he was dehydrated starving almost didn't make it through the night there were two dogs one didn't one didn't make it through the night right um and i just felt like some spirit inside him knew that his destiny was to be um a gentle vegan dog you know rid himself of that past karma of hunting pigs and all of that um and, and also at the same time heal himself from the trauma that he had been through because he did become so much stronger and um, more confident in his later years. We called him valiant because he was so afraid. He was just like timid. And, um, he used to look up at you with this look like, why are you being nice to me? I, I'm, I'm terrible. Don't you know I deserve beatings? And, you know, it's like he, he had no faith in himself at all. But we oh. helped him to respond. He was one of the most beautiful dogs I've ever known. Such a sweetheart. 
anyway, I digress. <laughs> oh, no, it's not digress. It's perfect, you know, because it's it's that love. It's that love for all beings that allows yes. us. Sorry, that we have a picture of him right here. <laughs> Oh, so beautiful. People used to stop us in the street to ask about him. They just saw that he had this. A woman from Honolulu wanted a cake and from <laughs> just seeing a picture of him. That's right. Aww. She, did. she yeah. wanted him to be part of helping her to train service dogs. She knew just from his picture, she knew that he had this empathy or compassion or ability to connect or something because she wanted she trained service dogs and she wanted him to be her companion dog to help teach other dogs and just from the picture she knew she wanted him but we he was at that point he was still so traumatized we couldn't imagine letting him go well anywhere. we wouldn't let him go anyway well, well at a certain point there was no way we were letting him go yeah he was a wonderful wonderful guy didn't bark by the way he was a silent silent dog yeah and so gentle, just wonderful. I mean, it was amazing to watch him with our rabbit. And we've had that in the past with vegan dogs. We had at one point a very old dog who used to, we had a cat who just decided to adopt us, just walked in off the street, moved in, just decided this is my place now. And it was right as we had an aging, an elderly dog who was kind of crippled with arthritis. And we had a rabbit. And the rabbit would come in from his place on the deck and hang out with Barbara the dog and the cat and the three of them would all come in and cuddle together. And it was just amazing to see, you know, when animals are gentle and when they're, you know, when the dogs don't have that meat in them, their aggressive tendencies really um, soften. Well, you, you can remember the expression fighting like dogs and cats. When I was a kid, dogs and cats always fought. There were no dogs and cats together. And now I see on the internet there's elephants and horses and and I, personally I think they're banding together against the they discover who the common enemy is. I'm sorry to say it's human being because you see animals together on the internet that never ever would have birds and mice and cats and just I think they've gotten together and said, hey, why are we fighting each other? That's not our enemy anyway. That's just a personal belief. <laughs> That's very, very intriguing, you know, and it makes complete sense on an energetic level. You know, they, they realize, they realize it's us humans. They need to protect all, every species realize they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're going to be better in numbers for, for certain. So if somebody wants to come like myself to gentle world, is there a certain amount of time that they have to stay um, or can they come and visit? Can people sign up and do a, some SIVA work uh, at, at the Tree of Life when I was there? You know, we could sign up for a one month or three month SIVA work. How does it work there at Gentle World? We usually, we have a, um, a contact us form on our website. So people can write there, go to gentleworld.org, go to the contact us page, send us a little message. We're very friendly. We'll get back to you. We could start a dialogue. We usually suggest that people um, imagine coming for like a two-week stay. Um, but if, if a two-week stay is going well, we can extend it. Uh, we're just not able to commit to longer than two weeks um, off the bat. But, but people often come. We're in Hawaii, so it's kind of a long way for, for many people to come. So we usually suggest that they you know, visit some other places at the same time as coming to see us. There are some other vegan places on the island. There are a couple of animal sanctuaries, um, you know, come and make it a, a little um, more than just visiting us, but imagine that you could spend a couple of weeks here in Gentle World. And we start that, like I said, just with the initial contact us form. And then we have an application form that we send to people and um, do a little Zoom interview, get to know people a little bit better. Um, and yeah, we certainly welcome all inquiries like that for sure. And maybe you will come and visit Tammy. Hey, I can... will. I will. I will be there. I'm in Canada. It gets very cold here for many, many months, and I can come and. Oh, right. I would love. I would love to have a film crew there and and start filming your your community a little bit. You know, it'd be lovely for. I think the grandmothers would really love to start to do some footage because maybe eventually the million vegan grandmothers, when we go more global. Uh, we're mostly in North America. We have a few members from other places. 
when we go global, then, you know, maybe we'll have a documentary of all the grandmothers in all different areas, you know, speaking for the grand, the grandchildren of all species. So thank you very much. Any final words, Light? Well, my, my, my main uh, desire, being a 50-year, 53-year vegan now, is to give people hope, especially those who have just started being vegan. So they look around and see it's still going on, it's still killing, it's still without feeling. But I just want to impress, in, in my view, the overall view, it's come a long way and there's great hope. The change, I can't even go into all the changes. I, I couldn't buy a pair of shoes. We couldn't buy shoes that weren't leather back then. We couldn't buy, we couldn't buy bread, forget about ice cream. Now we have all those things. And vegan has become a popular, they used to make fun of anything vegan on TV, tofu, they would only make fun of it. Now I see everybody who's got somebody in their family that's a vegan, their granddaughter, their kids, their whatever. I, I just see it as a great hope, even though it's far from accomplished. I just want to impress upon the grandmothers and everybody else who's listening. It's come a long, long way and it's only going to come further. There's no turning it around. It's a truth. And there's no stopping a truth that's become apparent. Become Thank you. Apparent. Yes. And, and as, as the founder of um, uh, Drawdown, what, what's the um, Drawdown? Oh, I'm, I'm forgetting. But he said that, you know, things move very, very slowly and then they, they change all of a sudden. And I think that's the movement we're in the middle of right now. And as you talked about, you know, tofu, one of our grandmothers who are part of our community, Liz Gary, she was a chef who converted to be a vegan chef. And her book that will be out this summer is called Black Belt and Tofu. She figures she must have her Black Belt and Tofu by now. So keep an eye out for that book. Any final words, Angel? And thank you. And I loved, I, I watched a few of your interviews and I loved, uh, Light, how you said that our names represent, you know, the way we're living. And, and I also really appreciate your t-shirt, the, the Future is Vegan. So Angel and Light, I, that's a representation of, of what you're providing to the world. So thank you. And Angel, any final words? I just want to thank you for doing the podcast and all the work that people do to help shine a light on veganism and, and make that available to people, I think is, is uh, righteous work. So I'm grateful to you for what you do and all of your people watching. Everybody just keep in mind that all the work you do for veganism is work towards a better world, a brighter world, and it gives people hope for the future, it gives us hope for the future. That's an interesting word, righteous. You know, the the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, they have a, a panel of people they call the righteous who help them, who, who help the Jews to escape the penalty, the death. And, uh, you know, people think that they say vegans are uh, self-righteous, self-righteous. But the truth is, those people were righteous in the Holocaust. And, and vegans are the righteous people between Killing and not killing, it's obvious that we're the righteous ones. I don't, you know, I don't care if they don't like that expression, but it's true. It doesn't really matter. It's not about, you know, we're more righteous than you. It's, you know, that's all distraction from the point, which is this is not okay to keep doing this. You know, anybody who looks honestly into their own conscience will agree that what we do to other animals is not right. So fighting to help protect them and help other people understand that is righteous work in the most pure and honest meaning of it, which is it's doing doing what's right. And um, I'm just grateful for anybody who's who's doing that. So thank you. Thank you yes. for what you're doing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And we will meet again. And our little closing, usually with the grandmothers, is namaste vegan.